brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We have uh, one anniversary to uh, recognize today. That is the anniversary of our church. So happy 191st anniversary to Sackville Baptist. And of course, I think our church deserves the full anniversary treatment. <laughs> Happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, for a cheerful toast and fill it, happy anniversary, but be careful you don't spill it, happy anniversary, oh, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Sackville Baptist. Uh, to commemorate the anniversary, we are going to have a potluck lunch after uh, the service today downstairs. Um, so the conclusion of the service in, addic in addition to the benediction, I will also have grace at that time. So you don't need to wait for the slow poke pastor to get downstairs. You can partake right away when you head downstairs for that meal. Uh, I'll be staying for the meal, but I might uh, be leaving early uh, this afternoon at Bedford Baptist. Uh, we have the ordination service for our pastor of youth and family, Derek Thorne. Uh, so that's going on today. I have my usual editing to do. And might be football in there somewhere, I'm just saying, you know. So, But uh, I will be with you downstairs for the meal as long as possible. There is one birthday I'm aware of uh, to celebrate uh, this week. Uh, Herbie, I believe you are celebrating a, a birthday. Oh, he's so shy over there. <laughs> we have to sing happy birthday to Herbie. Happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true. May God's richest blessings abide upon you. And many more. Happy birthday. Uh, that's all the announcements I have. Are there any other announcements this morning? Well, I just, I just want to say that if you didn't bring anything from the potluck, don't worry. Because there is lots of food down there. So if you want to stay, please do so. And also, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, we have a new grandmother in the congregation. Yes. I, I did not. Go ahead. Roxanne became... Got her header. Was it your second grandchild? Second grandson. Yeah, second grandson. Uh, October the 25th, was it? Yeah. Congratulations. She did her the golden apparel. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. He didn't want to go without. Not sure how that happened, Mark. I wonder. Thank you. Thank you for making mention of uh, that, Mark. We don't want to forget uh, special events like that either. I will turn to our, our, sorry, our call to worship for today, getting ahead of myself there, uh, with your responses in the white type. The Lord has been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, God is God, and so we come to worship. God satisfies us every morning with steadfast love. Let us rejoice and be glad all our days. Tell of God's glorious power and praise God's holy name. We will offer God the work of our hands and praise from the depths of our hearts. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, you are gracious and loving, holy and eternal. 
Your love is steadfast, your presence ever near. We offer you our prayers and praise this day in humble expectation. Surprise us in this time of worship and refresh our readiness to serve you. Amen. Our opening hymn for today is number 95. Revive us again, number 95. I'm going to call upon Leanna at this time for her first scripture reading for today. Good morning. Our first scripture is from Matthew 17, verse 24 to 27. Jesus and his followers went to Capernaum. There the men who collect the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay the temple tax? Peter answered, yes, he does. Peter went into the house where Jesus was. Before Peter could speak, Jesus said to him, the kings on the earth get different kinds of taxes from people, but who are those who pay the taxes? Are they the king's children? Or do other people pay the taxes? What do you think? Peter answered, the other people pay the taxes. Jesus said, then the children of the king don't have to pay taxes. But we don't want to upset these tax collectors. So do this. Go to the lake and fish. After you catch the first fish, open its mouth. Inside its mouth you will find a four drachma coin. Take that coin and give it to the tax collectors. That will pay the tax for you and me. Thank you, Leanna. Let us once more unite our hearts in prayer. Faithful God and holy friend, we do not have enough words to thank you for all you have given us and the love you share with us in Christ Jesus. In these quiet moments together, help us review the week just past, remembering the ways we encountered you. In the beauty of creation, the support of friends, the wisdom of books, the joy of music, the energy of exercise through study and prayer. God of comfort and challenge, we are grateful for your presence in these uncertain times at home, at work, and at school. We give you thanks for your attention to the small details and the large responsibilities we face. Make us attentive to the needs of those around us. 
God of justice and leadership, we pray for our country and nations of the world facing immense challenges. Guide decision makers in these complex times and keep the hearts of those with resources open to those who do not have enough. We pray for places where justice is lacking, where violence threatens or leaders are untrustworthy. Strengthen voices of wisdom and acts of courageous compassion to tend the needs of people most at risk. God of persistence and inspiration, we remember before you the many who struggle to recognize your presence or fail to hear your voice amid all the competing voices in our world. We pray for those feeling depressed or anxious, those facing grief and loneliness, and those who are worried about their health or their future. Do not forget these people, even if they forget you sometimes. Comfort them and fill them with your peace. At this time, we especially pray for Mark and Sheila, Nancy and Reuben, Joanne, the Benoit family, Larry and Larry's brother John, Heather's great niece Dawn and Dawn's mother Pauline, Roland and Susan, Susan Rosevere and Greta, Wendy's niece Christine, Michelle, Alyssa, Marion White's nephew Don, Bernice's nephew George, Wayne and Mark's son Mark and Mark's sister Judy, Kathy McDonald, Krista and her aunt Arlene, Herbie and Renetta's son Keith, Pam Weber, Pam Lewis, Karina and Marion Langell. We offer prayers of praise for Nancy and for Bernice's nephew, George, that the prognosis going forward for both of them is so positive and healthy. And we pray for our world as it deals with natural disasters, homelessness, poverty, violence, and war. God of grace and guidance, you call us to be your hands and feet, your voice and comfort in the world, following the example of Jesus. Equip us to respond to the needs around us in his name and make us bold to get started right here and right now. For we dare to pray the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm now going to call upon our choir at this time, who will bless us in music with their selection, What a Day That Will Be.
<laughs> Too many pieces of paper. Good morning, everyone. Second scripture reading today is from Luke 4, um, 38 to 39. Jesus left the synagogue and went to Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was very sick. She had a high fever. They asked Jesus to do something to help her. He stood very close to her and ordered the sickness to go away. The sickness left her, and she got up and began serving them. And God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Mary. Before we discuss, uh, further discuss God's word to us today, let's sing another hymn at this time. Number 171, Take Time to Be Holy, number 171. thank you for the gift of your word and as we think on these things open our hearts and minds to hear your word to us amen there is that well-known saying that everything old is new again and perhaps a lesser known saying that there is nothing new in hollywood with the inference being that there aren't many original ideas out there anymore. And what we often get in movies and TV are just the same old topics and plots and themes recycled over and over again. As much as I love them, I realize you only have to tune in to one or two Hallmark movies. <laughs> to realize they're just replaying the same old plot elements over and over again. Oh, so good. I know, I agree. <laughs> you know the story, Big City Girl returns to her small town roots, encounters the old boyfriend, the one that got away, hijinks ensue, old feelings are rekindled, and there's some kind of misunderstanding that threatens the couple getting back together again before everything all works out in the end and they live happily ever after. 
Sometimes the Hollywood studios don't even try to hide the fact that they don't have an original idea and they let you know they are completely copying an old property and just trying to update it somewhat for a modern day audience. Yes, we live in the age of the remake or the reboot where old TV shows get dusted off and modernized for a 21st century audience. For instance, you could have tuned in any time over the last 10 years or so and swear that you've been transported back to the early 70s whenever you heard this music kick in. I know, we wouldn't want that to happen now, would we? Yes, the original Hawaii Five-0 TV series, which ran from 1968 to 1980, was completely rebooted and updated in, 20, in 2010. It still featured lots of beautiful Hawaiian scenery. It had a Steve McGarrett and a Danny Williams, although I don't think the modern day Steve said, book him, Dano, near as often as the old one did. Hawaii was a popular destination and background for TV series and was featured in another popular show that also recently got remade. Perhaps you recognize this particular theme. Yes, I agree. The original Magnum P.I. TV series ran from 1980 to 1988 and also recently got remade and that reboot is currently wrapping up its run with its final 10 episodes. I've enjoyed watching the new Magnum with my boys but I can't quite convince them that the new Magnum can't hold a candle to the old Magnum. <laughs> Played by Tom Selleck with his signature mustache and his tank tops and his short shorts. <laughs> One final old TV show that has gotten rebooted in the last few years contains what might be my favorite TV theme song ever. See if you recognize this one. The original SWAT TV show, yes that was SWAT, yeah. surprisingly only lasted for two seasons back in 1975-1976, but it was a popular enough property that it got remade into a movie starring Samuel L. Jackson in 2003 before getting another chance as a TV series starting in 2017. This is another one that I enjoy watching with the boys, although I, I drive them a little crazy with the music. Because every time the main credits start to roll and that music kicks in, my boys always say to me, why don't you just fast forward through the credits? We don't need to see that every time. To which I always reply, boys, I hate to tell you this, but we will never, ever fast forward through the theme from SWAT. I think they just roll their eyes at me, but I think they've learned to live with it. You might get the feeling that I watch a lot of TV with my boys, and you'd be right. It's funny because sometimes we'll be watching, so I wonder what you two were thinking as you're counting the money back, and you hear all this old TV theme show music playing, right? So, <laughs> you'll have to watch later on, right? So, 
Uh, sometimes we'll be watching something, me and the boys, and a particularly dramatic scene will come on and someone will say something deep and profound and the boys will look at me and say, coming up with another sermon idea, Father? <laughs> and I'll usually smile and nod my head and say, yeah, I can see that finding its way into a future message. And such was the case one night when we were watching, of all things, an episode of SWAT. Now, you wouldn't think that show would be a leading candidate to have something profound to say that would end up in a sermon. After all, SWAT is an action show set in Los Angeles that deals with a unique police force, the Special Weapons and Tactics Unit, otherwise known as SWAT, which is the last stop in law enforcement in L.A., you wouldn't think that a show that features tons of car chases and shootouts and hand-to-hand -hand combat would have a lot of profound and insightful things to say. However, one of the main characters on the show is a police sergeant by the name of David Kay, otherwise known as Deacon. Deacon is a devout Catholic, and in one episode he is visited at the station house by Father Dorner, an old priest friend, who helped Deacon get through some difficult times in his life. And the two men have a friendly rapport as they renew old acquaintances. Father Dorner, can't tell you how great it is to see your face again. David, or should I say Sergeant? But you got silver around the edges. Yeah, a little more salt and pepper now, yeah. You're one to talk. Well, I went great at 35. Working in a trauma wing will do that. Yeah. Look at this place. I am proud of you, David. A fulfilling job, a family at home. It's amazing how far you've come since that angry young man in the hospital bed. I really was angry, wasn't I? It's just that I was a different person back then. Sometimes I wonder how I even got here from there. I learned early on as a chaplain, what's that old quote? Uh, the most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen. Hmm. That last line, the most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen, has stuck in my head ever since then. It is an actual quote from author G.K. Chesterton in one of his Father Brown Mysteries novels, and it speaks to an essential truth that we don't always acknowledge or pay attention to as much as we should. Because in a reality that is so often marred by doubt and pessimism and skepticism. We actually live in a world where miracles really do happen. People who are deathly sick get well again. Children who come into the world with birth complications go on to lead healthy and productive lives. Someone who should have died in an accident somehow manages to survive. Someone down on their luck inherits a large sum of money. Long lost lovers separated by distance and time somehow find each other again. I know that last one sounds like a Hallmark movie, but I have heard stories about it actually occurring in real life. The bottom line is that despite what some cynical person might have you believe, miracles, amazing, breathtaking, awe-inspiring miracles actually really do happen in incredible ways in our modern-day 21st century world. In some ways, it all depends on what you consider a miracle to be. Because miracles come in all shapes and sizes, big and small, collectively to a group of people and on a deeply personal level as well. David Kay, also known as Deacon, was well aware of the deeply personal level of miracles. He wasn't always a fine, upstanding member of SWAT. At 21, he was as young and foolish as any other 21-year-old. And one weekend, he and his buddy Keith left Los Angeles and headed to Las Vegas because Deacon really wanted to see a band that would be playing there that weekend. Deacon knew he had an early morning construction job in L.A. to get back for, but he was too tired to drive, so he convinced Keith to do it instead. And as they headed back home, Deacon settled into the passenger seat and fell asleep. Unfortunately, Somewhere along the way, Keith fell asleep too. 
Deacon would wake up in a hospital bed to discover that he had survived a terrible car crash, but his friend Keith hadn't. It was at this point that Deacon first encountered Father Dorner, who helped him process why he, David Kay, had miraculously survived while his friend Keith hadn't. And at the conclusion of this particular episode of SWAT, Deacon and Father Dorner meet at confessional and reflect on that one fateful night and Deacon's faith journey and the miracles along the way. For 20 years I've tried to tell myself it wasn't my fault. The problem is, it's kind of a lie, isn't it? If I hadn't forced Keith to drive, if I just stayed awake, I'd been a good friend. He'd still be here. I'm sorry to Keith, his family, to God. I've always been so, so sorry. God knows that. Keith does too. The tragedy isn't what turned your life around, David. By the grace of God, you made that choice. Then why do I still feel guilty? Because a miracle happened to you. David Kay, a flawed young man who became a less than perfect adult. You never felt worthy of that transformation, and yet a miracle happened, didn't it? I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in a very religious house. We went to Mass on Christmas and Easter. I always felt like an imposter sitting there. When that changed? It was the day at Keith's funeral. You were still in the hospital. Yeah, but you wheeled me to the chapel. Broke it in every way. And for hours, I just stared at that altar. A colorful light was streaming out of the monstrance. And I couldn't take my eyes off Christ. God willing, I hope I never do. It took me years to realize it, but that day, my life had direction. That was my miracle. No one does stained glass like Catholics. You've helped me more than you, than you could possibly know, Father. Thank you. Right back at you. God, the Father of mercies, has sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. May God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As he reflected back, David Deacon K realized he had experienced it all, miracles both big and small. The dramatic, heart-wrenching miracle of surviving an automobile accident that had claimed the life of his friend, and the even bigger miracle, perhaps, of how he had allowed that night to change him for the better. As he tells one of his co-workers, as hard as it is to say, that accident put my life on track, gave me my faith, made me worthy of a woman like my wife, Annie, of my kids. And as we just heard Deacon admit to Father Dorner as they reflected about the occasion of Keith's funeral, it took me years to realize it, but that day my life had direction. That was my miracle. Miracles that save our lives, both physically and spiritually. Miracles, both big and small. When we think of miracles, we usually think of the Bible and, and the big dramatic ones, like the parting of the Red Sea, or Jesus curing people of leprosy or blindness, or, of course, the biggest miracle of them all, when God raised Jesus from the dead. However, our two readings for today remind us that there is room for miracles of the smaller variety in God's word as well. In Luke's gospel, we reach the point in the narrative when we realize that the follower of Jesus known as Peter is married. As Luke tells us that Peter's mother-in-law is quite sick with a high fever. Yes, it's a fever and something to be concerned about, but it's not quite in the same category as healing someone who has never walked before, someone who was both deaf and mute, who were some of the people that Jesus healed in other parts of Scripture. Here, though, with P 
Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus doesn't make a big production of it. He simply stands close to her and says, hey, sickness, go away. And the fever leaves her and she gets up and actually starts preparing a meal for her visitors. No, there's not much to it, but it is a miracle in its own way nonetheless. And then there is the miracle of the fish. Not the great fish from the book of Jonah, not the fish that are part of the small meal that Jesus uses to feed 5,000 people. No, this is the fish that Jesus directs Peter to find that will contain one large silver coin in it that will be enough to pay the temple tax for both Peter and Jesus. A tax that Jesus doesn't seem to think is fair or that they should have to pay, but he doesn't want to rock the boat at this point in his journey towards the cross. This story, this tiny miracle, is both a little puzzling and a little funny. I mean, why does Peter have to go fishing for the coin? What is it doing in the mouth of a fish anyway? Couldn't Jesus have just done some sleight of hand to make the coin appear out of nowhere in his fingers? And I wish I had, you know, magician skills so I could have actually done it for you, but not part of my skill set. Couldn't he have done that without the whole fishing adventure that he was going to send Peter on? Who knows? The Lord does work in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Regardless, this story is yet another example of how miracles don't have to be of the big variety, and that they can appear in tiny and completely unexpected ways too. And my friends, it's important for us to realize that miracles, both big and small, aren't just something that happened in the far distant past, but that are very much still a part of our world even today. We just have to recognize them when we see them. Writer Diana Aiden writes a blog post, and at one point she asked her readers to write back to her with her responses to this one simple question, how do you define a miracle? And the responses that she got back showed that miracles could be of the big or small variety, and that miracles are indeed alive and well even today. Here are some of those responses. Life is a miracle. Each day we wake up is a miracle. Unexplained gifts and blessings are miracles. They are examples of God's divine love and mercy. A miracle is when your husband is diagnosed with brain cancer, has surgery, goes through chemo and radiation therapy, and when he has a post-treatment MRI, it is completely clean. God created a miracle by curing him. To God goes the glory. A miracle is the gift of God for us when we make a difference in someone's life, give a helping hand, be kind and compassionate, and every day when we never lose faith and hope. A miracle to me right now is going day to day, conquering small obstacles life has thrown at me, too many to explain. So as I pray, I ask to conquer another miracle tomorrow, be it small or large. I will take as many as I can accomplish each day, even if it is very small. Sometimes it's something we need or even someone to talk with when all goes wrong. There before our eyes, it happens. I like to say that miracles happen all the time. In a sunrise, a sunset, a newborn baby's cry, just a phone call or a card when we really need it. God is always there to help us with miracles and angels. There are miracles all around us. The flowers, the trees, my niece's daughters, I could go on. The clouds in the sky and the rain that falls down. This world is filled with miracles if only people would see them stephanie verney in her article the magic of miracles wrote you probably have experienced your own little miracles in your lives as well 
the birth of your children, finding your spouse, falling in love, leaving behind a bad relationship, being able to help others when they need it. I mean, the fact that the sun rises and sets each day is miraculous in itself. Truthfully, have you ever really thought about how beautiful the world can be when we're not yelling and screaming at each other on social media over stupid, idiotic stuff? When you see a glorious rainbow or watch people's kindness toward one another. And Amy Reese Anderson in her article, If You Don't Believe in Miracles, states for the record, I believe in miracles. I believe they happen every day. Sometimes they are blatant and so obvious that you cannot deny them, like a baby being born or a sick person being healed. Other times they are small, and the only way to notice them is to pay attention. Like when a seeming coincidence leads you down a path you needed to take, or when you bump into an old friend the moment you needed someone who cares. And then there are those miracles we are surrounded by every day of our lives, the ones we take for granted, such as the beauty of a rose or the majesty of the mountains or the crashing of the waves against the shore or the rainbow following the storm or the sun as it rises in the morning. And she concludes, yes, life is full of miracles. They are all around us. We just have to watch for them and believe in them and appreciate them when they happen. The more we thank God for the miracles in life, the more we will see them happening all around us. And perhaps this anonymous quote sums it all up the best. We live on a blue planet that circles around a ball of fire next to a moon that moves the sea and you don't believe in miracles. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the age of miracles didn't end with the conclusion of the biblical narrative. They are still all around us of the big and small variety in simple and profound ways whether it be by surviving a tragic accident or a bleak medical diagnosis or by how we choose to turn our lives around because of that first initial miracle. Just look around you and see. Let us pray. Wonderful Father, you are great and you do wondrous things. You alone are God. How great are your signs and how mighty are your wonders. We know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, we expect you to display your glory in the lives of those among us who are in need of miracles. We expect diseases to be dissolved, broken relationships to be mended, and those who are held captives in their minds and souls to be set free. Lord, help them to believe in the impossible and look to you for healing, deliverance, and spiritual prosperity. Cause your miracles to be experienced through our families, through our church, and through our community so that your name will be glorified throughout the land. All these things we pray in the name of the greatest miracle of them all, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 64, For the Beauty of the Earth, number 64. Just a reminder after the hymn that we will have grace and the benediction. Then our choral benediction, then you can head downstairs and enjoy the potluck meal together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this church. 191 years is nothing to sneeze at. We thank you for how long this church has been here ministering to this community. We thank you that for the people that are here today that continue to be the fellowship of God, the body of Christ, and as we seek to find ways that we can still minister to our community in the name and in the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity to celebrate together downstairs, to enjoy this meal together. Thank you for all the hands that have prepared uh, the food. We ask that you provide us with nourishment and strength for the day, that you will bless our fellowship, our time together, our conversation. And when we leave here today, that we will be refreshed and energized and ready to face the challenges that this week will bring, knowing that your spirit will be with us in miraculous ways every step of the way. Go with love for God filling your hearts to show love to each neighbor or stranger you meet in the week ahead. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true.